Hello and welcome to the Petticoated Swashbuckler. Uh, I'm Marin, and today we're going to ask ourselves the big question that has been asked by women throughout the ages. Does my bum look big in this? <laughs> So I'm in, I'm just starting a project where I'm going to recreate the uh, items belonging to a fairly wealthy uh, 18th century English woman. Um, and whenever I'm recreating anything, really, no matter what period it is, I like to start from the skin and work my way outwards. And therefore, I'm going to do that this time as well, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, underwear before we get started, uh, or you might call it shapewear, um, or most historical costumers will call it uh, the foundations or the foundation layer. Um, and the foundations are really important um, because your body will change shape a lot depending on what kind of underwear or what kind of shapewear that you're using. My body looks very different in a 1950s bullet bra and girdle uh, compared to when I'm wearing a uh, an 1850s um, corset and um, crinoline, for example. And in the 18th century, it's really important because your foundation layer really is the foundation on which you build your garments. A lot of the garments are constructed onto the foundations. Um, therefore, I'm going to start by making those. Um, I love underwear, pretty historic underwear, uh, and I love what it can do to you and what it can do to your dress or your your garments. Um, and I also know that you can it can change um, an outfit a lot. I've seen people wear beautiful, gorgeous, exquisitely handmade, embroidered, amazing gowns and outfits. But instead of wearing it with the proper you know, corset and petticoats, people have gone with just a modern bra and uh, pantyhose and it changes the look. It makes it look, not only does it make it look uh, less historically accurate, that might not be that important to you, but it does it make it look a lot cheaper. It can make a really gorgeous uh, piece of, of clothing look very ch like a cheap Halloween costume. And I have nothing against cheap Halloween costumes for Halloween, but I, I spend a lot of time and money and effort uh, on my garments and I don't want them to look cheap and I don't think you do either so even though I can't decide what you what you have to do I, I can't decide that you have to wear historic underwear uh, I just highly highly recommend it I do understand why a lot of modern people do not want to wear historic underwear because we've all heard the horror stories right like oh they had their petticoats were so big they caught fire or uh, their corsets were so tight they couldn't breathe and they fainted or their dresses were so constricted they couldn't move and had to sit still for hours on end and if that was true I wouldn't want to wear those kinds of, of garments but neither would most women throughout history uh, and most people even the the fairly wealthy ones had to do some sort of work, some sort of movement. They had to, you know, maybe run a household, um, make uh, visits, travel. Uh, they would attend uh, parties and dance. And, and you can't do that if, you're, if your clothing doesn't allow you to move or breathe uh, or exist without catching fire and dying. So these aren't true. People didn't just dress up you know, and sit still. Um, people actually wore these kinds of garments and lived their lives in them. And 
uh, I can't, I'm not saying you have to wear historic underwear. I'm not saying that if you don't start by making underwear and then creating other garments on top of those, that I'm gonna go, I'm gonna come to your Instagram and be mean. I'm not gonna do that uh, because we all have different preferences uh, and we all do things differently, but I would recommend it. It works really well for me and it just, it feels like the most logical way of doing things. So, underwear. Now, there is actually quite a lot of underwear mentioned in um, Mrs. Bamford's inventory. There are several shifts, uh, white linen shifts, that's the innermost uh, underwear layer. Um, uh, there, is several, there are several mentions of stockings of various colours and there are uh, mentions of three pairs of stays, that's the corset layer, and um, a pair of pocket hoops, that's the um, the underwear that make that gives the sort of very very 18th century big hips. It looks like a small bread basket on each side of your hip. Uh, now we don't know exactly, or I don't know exactly uh, when Mrs. Bamford died. Uh, the Louise Walpole Library there has her inventory in their archives, estimated to be from around 1780. I don't know when, she, you know, how old she was when she died either. Um, towards the end of the 18th century, uh, life expectancy at birth had risen to about 40 years, but that is at birth. Um, and this is a period where very high uh, child mortality rates, a lot of people died, maybe between 20 and 25 percent of the population died before they were five years old. Uh, maybe as many as 30 to 40 percent of the population died before they were um, adults, before they reached adulthood. So that would have, you know, contributed to, to that very low life expectancy. And Mrs. Bamford very clearly survived into adulthood. And she might have died uh, fairly young, when she was between 20 and 30, um, from childbirth, for example, that was fairly common. Um, or she might, if she survived all her childbirths, or she didn't have any children, which I think is possible and, and maybe even plausible, because if she had children, she might not have needed to make uh, an inventory uh, because then her children would inherit it. Most inventories I found from the 18th century are made by men or they list the belongings of men and I found a few that list the belongings of widows but seeing as this inventory doesn't mention anything but clothing uh, she might not have been a widow uh, and or that might just be on another inventory we don't know but it's plausible that she didn't have children or that she survived her childbirths and in that case she might be fairly old 70 or 80 years old so somewhere between there um i'm gonna go with i'm gonna for sake of argument say that she died when she was about 50 years old and just to stress this, I have no evidence that's how old she was. Um, this is just uh, based on, on, on guesswork, but I am a historian, so technically it's educated guesswork. Uh, in which case, she would have been born around 1730. And say that, let's say that she uh, started um, building and, and uh, developing her wardrobe when she was about 20 years old. That would give us a time frame from between uh, 1750 uh, and 1780. And it's a great period of time because there are a lot of changes in fashion, in the way garments are uh, constructed, in the where they, what they're inspired by, in changes in hairstyles, trims, um even uh you know that the shape the very um uh, you know characteristic wide hips towards 1780 they start moving backwards 
into a big bum instead. Um, and this bum was uh, created uh, by the use of a false bum, a bum pad, or sometimes called a false rump, or a bum, uh, as in this wonderful car uh, caricature drawing from, from London, it was published in London in 1785, of the bum shop. And you can see here a great range of different bums you can buy. Um, so I'm going to start off by making myself a bum, a false bum. Uh, there is no bum or bum pad or bum roll or false rump mentioned in the inventory. I don't know for certain that Mrs Bamford did not own one. Uh, maybe she'd already given it away, maybe she had bought one but not had it made up yet, maybe um, maybe the people who made the inventory didn't know what it was and didn't list it or listed it as something else, uh, or maybe she'd planned to get one but hadn't got around to do it yet, or maybe she felt that it was a bit too fashion forward, she was a bit too old maybe, I don't know. But I still, because I want to make uh, dresses from that entire 30 year range. Uh, I I really want to make um, to, to show the differences. I really want to make myself a false bum. And now it might seem weird when you have an inventory of several hundred items uh, to start by making something that's not on the inventory at all. But truth is, as eager as I am to get going with this. I'm a bit apprehensive as well um, and this is a very good way for me to sort of ease my way into my project um, without the pressure of, of like you're gonna start by making a brocaded silk nightgown which is the first item on the list. Uh, that would be a bit harsh I think. This way I can start my project and without the pressure of it having to be perfect because you're starting on the uh, inventory straight away. So uh, yeah, let's get started. The pattern I'm using is from the American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Dressmaking and the pattern itself is very simple. It's uh, basically two big pillows uh, mounted on a sort of skirt but the book does include a formula uh, that allows you to calculate uh, how much you need to increase your hip girth uh, by. So I've done that, I've changed the pattern and uh, I'm now counting squares. Um, I'm not gonna be bothering to, to make a pattern for the skirt part because that's just a, yeah, that's just a rectangle, but the pocket is a bit more complicated so I'm uh, making a, pa a pattern for that and I'm just cutting it out of all uh, wrapping paper which isn't ideal because you can see it's quite sort of curled up and uh, wobbly but it works fine uh, this isn't super uh, careful uh, sewing anyway and then also always uh, remember to uh, label your pattern pieces even if you're not planning to actually use them again, just so that you know what they're for and uh, what to avoid. I try to make 19th century skirt pockets with an 18th century pocket pattern ones. Didn't work well, wouldn't recommend it. For this project, I'm trying to only use uh, things that are already in my stash. Now the uh, book uses uh, striped cotton for this and I do have a couple of striped cottons even though I know that I don't have to follow the book uh, that precisely, I kind of liked how it looked when it was striped. And also stripes are fun to work with. And I have a cotton I think will work perfectly. So I'm going with this. I have a lot of this fabric, so I will probably uh, be using it for several uh, projects in the future. And I'm just measuring uh, the skirt part, the skirt piece first. 
Of course, one of the great things about working with striped fabric is that you you don't have to mark your measurements as uh, precisely, you just find a stripe and you follow that. And also this uh, fabric is uh, terrible, not terrible, but terrible, uh, which makes it very easy, uh, very simple to get um, straight edges and also tearing fabric is very satisfying. So that is my skirt piece all done, just a simple rectangle. And uh, on to the pocket. Now I know I can get two pocket pieces uh, for each uh, width of fabric, so I'm just measuring how, how uh, much fabric I need to cut. And the reason why I know I can fit two is that I already cut two. So I'm just folding the fabric uh, four times. The, the pockets are cut on the fold. Placing the pattern on uh, and uh, pinning it and uh, cutting it. So that's all the pieces I need. Now the first thing I did was just hem my, uh, my skirt piece, the uh, sides and the bottom hem. I'm just using a very uh, simple hem stitch. Uh, it's not so easy to see because the thread matches my fabric very well, which is great for me and not so great for educational purposes. And then the skirt needs to be pleated down to half um, of my waist measurement. Now, these pleats do not need to be very nice because um, no one's ever going to see them. First of all, this is underwear. And then second of all, this is going to be underneath the big uh, bum uh, pillows as well and anyway uh, if you see if you look at extant garments extant 18th century garments uh, with pleating you'll see that people were not very uh, fuzzy about their pleats in the 18th century uh, they are varied so all that done I'm just basting the pleats down uh, I like to baste things down because it means I uh, I don't need to worry about my pins falling out. Then I sewed the pockets together just using a simple back stitch. And uh, when I was done, I cut some curves and I uh, turned them and pressed them. Now that's done, the underside of the pocket needs to be pleated down as well. Uh, the measurements uh, and the calculations are in the book, and I would highly recommend it. It's a great book. Again, not pleats you need to be super fussy about. Uh, these are the underside of the pillows. No one's ever going to see them. Uh, if anyone's that intimate with you and they complain about the pleats on your uh, false rump, uh, you kick them. Um, however, I'm a, I'm a fussy person, so I'm probably making more of a fuss about this than I need to. So just pinning these down uh, and uh, I basted those as well because basting is, basting is a good thing. And then these are pinned to the, uh, the skirt pieces. Once again, not something you need to be super precise about. As long as they edge up with the outer edge, it doesn't matter if there's a bit of a gap between the two pillows in the, in the back. Uh, the reason why we have two pillows, um, after all, is to, to get um, the back of the dress to lie flatter against, the, uh, against your back and your bum. So I'm just uh, pinning these onto my skirt and uh, basting that as well. And when that's done uh, on both, you will have a, a square of fabric with two pockets on the bum. Yeah, like I said, based, I base everything. It's better for my health, a uh, few pinpricks, and uh, also the more period thing to do. And uh, if we're going to talk about historical accuracy, um, which we might, maybe, I don't know. Uh, this would be uh, closer to the way people made uh, clothing in the 
18th century, as far as I know. Uh, having done that, I'm uh, attaching this Gruscan uh, ribbon. Uh, that's going to be my waist tape. Uh, I'm just uh, attaching it with uh, hem stitches to the back side. Doesn't matter if these stitches are visible in the front because I'm going to fold this tape over and cover them later anyway. Now the book calls for the, um, the feathers from an old pillow. Now I don't have an old pillow like that but what I do have is a lot of wool that I bought to felt and I bought way too much of it so I'm going to try and fluff that up a bit and uh, see if it works, see if I can stuff my uh, pillows with that instead. So I just hung my uh, skirt onto my dress form and started stuffing the pillows and it really turns out you need to fluff that stuff up uh, a lot otherwise it just gets lumpy uh, straight away. You also need um, quite a lot of it. I kept measuring because I was a bit afraid of, of overstuffing uh, my uh, pillow and ending up with a much too big bum, uh, but no, no worries about that. Um, it took a while uh, and it took a lot of wool and also I found it quite difficult to make sure that they were both even. Uh, and to make sure that the wool was fluffed enough uh, so that I don't didn't get any hard lumps because I don't want hard lumps um, on my bums. Uh, plural. When I was happy with them that they were uh, of the same size and, uh, and uh, sufficiently stuffed. Um, it looks very weird, it's like me touching my own bum on camera. Excuse me. Uh, when I was happy with them, uh, I and also happy with the measurement, uh, I actually ended up my tape measure is not long enough for this, so I ended up having to do some some creative calculations. But I had to increase my my hip measurement with uh, over 25 inches, which is quite <laughs> a lot, um, and. Uh, the reason why I'm measuring underneath uh, first and then on top afterwards was just because my uh, my dress form does not have my exact measurements. I'm uh, working on getting a new one as we speak. So having measured uh, and uh, found my tape to be too short but my bum to be sufficient, I uh, then could move on to pinning, um, pleating and pinning the tops of, um, or the upper sides of the pillows. I did this um, and tried to match uh, what I'd done on the underside. Not that anyone's ever going to notice, but I, I like things to be nice and even and pretty if I can. There are probably a million ways of doing this. I found that two inverted box pleats uh, was the best way for me to control the excess fabric. But this probably depends on your waist measurement, your hip measurement and uh, your fabric. Uh, this worked for me. You'll probably find a way uh, that works better for you if, you if you look for one. So I just pinned these down and uh, of course basted them when I was done with the pinning. And uh, with both pockets pleated and basted, I could fold my uh, waist tape over and uh, pin that into place, making sure I covered anything uh, that I wanted to cover. And then I just attached it with, uh, again, more hem stitching. It's one of my favourite stitches. It's so versatile and pretty and strong. It's a very durable thing. Now this did take a while because by now um, I had a lot of layers and my cotton was quite um, thick to begin with, uh, as was my grain ribbon. And uh, these pillows were now too big for me to just keep in my lap as I sew, so I have to 
uh, placed them on the table uh, as I uh, finished the waste tape. And now it's all ready to try on. That's my fake bum done. Um, it took me about eight hours and everything is hand sewn. And it cost me uh, nothing because I've used things that I already had in my stash um, and things that I bought for other projects but didn't use all of, that sort of thing. And I'm really happy with it. Uh, first of all, it's really fun to wear. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's, it feels funny. I, I like it. And I'm really happy the way it fit. Like, I was expecting some difficulty sitting because unlike a 19th century bustle, that's collapsible. This isn't. But they're bouncy enough, so it, it kind of works. And frankly, it's really comfortable because I'm having, I have like a big pillow um, at the small of my back, uh, which I always, or to have a small pillow at the small of my back when I'm sitting down, to be honest. So yeah, I'm very happy with that. Um, I'm a little uncertain about the wool um, because uh, one of the reasons why is that uh, it smells very woolly. Uh, I don't think this wool was, it was dyed, but not stripped of all the lanolin. So it smells very woolly. And I like that. I like, you know, I like the smell of wool. Mm, I'm just hoping that, you know, I won't be caught in rain and suddenly everyone around me will, will like shy away from me and the smell of wet sheep that comes along with me. <laughs> but we'll see. And I'm, I'm also a bit worried that as I wear it, and perspiration from my body um, and and the sort of constant rubbing of wool against wool inside my rump will felt it together and it'll get smaller but I mean if it does I'll just have to rip open a seam and and replace it with something else um, that's the beauty of hand sewing is that it's a lot easier to rip your seams like it's a lot easier to to undo your stitching and do them up again. Um, I'm also excited to find out how it'll look along with my new pair of stays that I'm planning to make because these are quite old and they don't fit me as well as they used to um, do. So um, I'm excited to see that um, but I mean there it's this waist, the waist tape just ties on so it's not like it's not going to fit on a new pair of stays. Um, yeah, so that's me done with the first part of the project um, and it's just for me to, you know, crack on with the next, next part of the project and uh, yeah, I'll see you uh, later. Um, until next time, 
be kind, be creative, and uh, be back.